Hello, listeners. My name is Lowell, pronouns he, him, and welcome to the Gauntlet Podcast. I'm joined by my co-host, Sherry. Hello. And this month we have with us Chris Sellers, who is designer of the recently, well, recently, I said uh, this earlier this year, kickstarted Raccoon Sky Pirates, which I played mm-hmm. and which I talked about in an earlier episode, which I quite enjoyed. I also know the first time I heard about Chris was when he posted on the Gauntlet Slack about having done Rogue's Galaxy, which is a hack book for Ash and Stars for Pelgrim Press, which I immediately ordered because i kind of into all of these different takes on it. And it's very cool. It's very cool. Chris, thank you for being on with us. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. Listeners, in our first segment, each of us is going to go over the RPGs that we've played in the last couple months, August, September at this point. And we're going to talk in depth about one game that we played on the Gauntlet gaming calendar itself. You know, each month we have about 100 sessions on the calendar. We have a lot of different GMs, all of them using safety tools and with a real focus on play, drop in and out. So we like to talk with our community about the games that we've been playing there. So, Sherry, let me start with you. How was your August-September gaming? Well, here's the thing is, my first initial thing is to say I've been loaded, so loaded down with project from work that I haven't been playing much. And then I kind of looked back and I'm like, oh my goodness, I have been in so many stellar games these last two months. But it's it's like there's so many of them that they are a constellation of brilliant moments. And um, it becomes like just part of the life and my, the world, you know, like the stars in the skies. <laughs> so let me tell you about the specific games I played. So Off Gauntlet and playing Songs for the Dusk. I'm playing Hearts of Lulin, which, of course, is one of my dearest games of all times. Perfect game for me. But also, I've been recently playing a playtest of a Forge in the Dark game of Courtly Intrigue. I'm not supposed to talk about it yet, but I will say that it actually is right up there with Hearts of Lulin for just hitting all those great spots for me. And I tried for the first time a Lumen hack. Um, This was one for the Evolve video game to sort of simulate that. And it was a ton of fun. Like it's all combat with a little bit of like sort of meaningful interaction. It's supposed to simulate the video game, but by the end of it, you end up having this really galvanizing play experience. And um, my hope is, is that I'll get to play some more. So I come to understand what part of Lumen is the Lumen part and what part was the Evolve part of that game. Okay. But on Gauntlet, I played Hearts of Lulin. There was a one shot that was really brilliant and wondrous. Changeling the Lost PBTA, which is my favorite mess of a game. Godbound, which for OSR games, I think really fills my heart with joy always and every time. And then we got back to Fate and we played a version of Fate for Skyship Concerto and that was magnificent and full of all of the creativity that fate can allow the players to go for and it was really beautiful and then another really interesting little one-shot game it's a cyberpunk game it is pronounced cyberpunk but it's actually spelled cyber dash punk but drop all the vowels. So CBR-PNK. I didn't want to say that without all the other descriptions because otherwise you would get lost on the the letters, I think. But it's a great little game. Essentially what it is, is it's a streamlined Forge in the Dark game that's specifically been engineered for a one-shot. So in this case, it's for one last job in a classic TTRPG-style cyberpunk world. It was written by Emmanuel Mello. And it's available on Itch.io and DTRPG, so you can get it both at DriveThru and Itch. It's in a really clever pamphlet layout that um, there's pamphlets for the GM and for the players. Very nice little, like, three-part fold, which would be lovely if we'd been playing physically, but of course we were online, so we had a nice (laughs) character sheet that took a lot of the pieces out of the layout, so I could still see how beautiful it was, and it would be really lovely in that three-part. The thing that was really interesting to me about it is the picks on the simplifications were really smart. Uh, Essentially, they took a different approach handling. There are explicit dots for the approaches, which is sort of the style or how you're doing a thing. And then there's dots for classic cyberpunk skills. You add the two when you're doing a test. And then when you're doing resistances, you just use the approach by itself. The game has no moves, but instead you get to create, pick cyberware abilities, like just one or two of them, depending on how many disadvantages you want to take. There's no experience track. 
And every character has an angle, a sort of reason why they're doing this last mission. And if your actions feed into that angle, you get another die. Mm, so it's nice. just like some really simple, fast to create the character, fast to understand what you're doing. There's a very short stress track that goes with it. There's only one refresh on that stress per session. There's a great gear section, which, of course, you would want with Cyberpunk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really delivers. <laughs> Lots of bits that you can define on the fly like what your Microtronics tools do or what special armor ammo you're carrying, what your armor is like, what it's armor against. All of these things you could do right on the fly and then just check the box off. So one of the things is like right on the sheet and for the system, there are these clearly defined teamwork actions, assist, set up, protect, lead group action. Those are the standards from the original game. Push and flashback for individuals. Those actions are also there, but they're right on the sheet defined you could use these. So nice. Presentation, those remain. There's no crew. There's no advancement. Hmm. So that's the basics of how they've simplified Forged in the Dark game. Interesting. Yeah. And it's great. I think what worked for me is the mapping to Cyberpunk was very good. I think approach, skill, breakdown, eliminate a ton of that. Wait, what approach am I supposed to use when I want to do this mental load that occurs when you're first introduced to Blades? or to any Forge in the Dark game. So it was super important for a one-shot, but it was also cleverly done. And then also, as was appropriate for the, the genre, I do think the gear choices were very fun and powerful. I really liked the way that they sort of replaced moves with cyber the cyberware features, but also the gear itself kind of felt like it did that thing. So you always have that those cyberware features at your disposal, you can use them at any time. They just add a die to the application. There's no spending for them and that kind of thing. It's just it's something you can always do. So it made it fast to understand and get to the table in a colorful way. There's a very short stress track. It made the single refresh feel super important. So <laughs> you were like, ooh, do I want to do it now or do I want to try another action before I do this because I'm only going to get this one. The harm system is short and simple. It's sort of each box makes you less likely to succeed. First, you have less effect with the minus one harms. With minus two, you have one less die. And then with the single three, you're considered out. And when you're out, it doesn't mean you're dead. It means that you can only act if you're assisted or if you're pushing. So you're either churning through your team's resources for stress or your own. Yeah, it just makes it really harder in that tense last moments. And then if you get hit again after you've like used up all of your harm options, the next blow brings you to time to die, which is, of course, your scene. So <laughs> and it was pretty good, pretty flavorful. And the Nice thing is, is that the presentations of all the player options everywhere were succinct and super useful. It was really well presented, really well put together. You kind of knew what you had to use, and that was nice. What I'm less sure about is it was designed for a one-shot, but because we were playing in a set time slot, we ended up going another session and doing a two-part last mission. We took another refresh. So we went a little easy on ourselves. I think things would have been a lot more desperate without that second refresh. So I will say that we just kind of went, oh, let's do another refresh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it just felt right. <laughs> I think due to the paucity of skill points, you really want at least three players to cover the standard skills you would need in a cyberpunk mission. I mean, it makes sense. You don't want too many dots because then it's too easy, but it's pretty tight. So I would say you would want at least three people to be, do, to hmm. be able to do all the things you think of doing in a cyberpunk mission. Otherwise, you would have to really narrow down how you were approaching things. I haven't seen the GM materials. They may be brilliant. I'm really kind of sad I didn't see them. I, that is the one thing. I haven't seen them, but I'm expecting that they're pretty darn good just because the presentation and layout, everything for the players was so well organized. The game we played was a hack Star Wars universe play. So it was part of the Gauntlet Star Wars Saturday series. So it did have a lot of interludes for color and world building. This meant our game was much less compressed than the design was actually intended for, probably. So again, that led into the second session. And this sort of, maybe we took it a little easier than straight <laughs> cyberpunk. So I, I will admit, at the end, I failed all my roles at the very end. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> And my lovely counselor had to fake her death and go criminally underground. And so it would like to play that game more. So I don't know if it's truly a one-shot game because you kind of, even when you end that one last mission, you kind of end up with a character you would like to see what happens after the last mission. 
So there you go. Definitely. That's <laughs> mm. And I think my takeaway is just that so far it looked like a really great distillation of those core mechanics for Forge in the Dark, simplified for quick understanding, which it kind of blew my mind how well that approach skill thing really helped with that cognitive load on the approaches in classic blades. I definitely suggest it if you're looking to play Forge in the Dark at a table that has a few folks that haven't played. It gives them a taste of the basic scheme mechanics and would definitely ease the transition into full blades. It's a really tidy system for a one shot. It was sort of just enough, just what you needed to get through everything. Highly likely to mean that your resources are going to be stretched by the time the player got past the halfway mark of the mission. It's also beautifully crafted. It's just a nice product. It's really worth a look at just for that. It's CBR-PNK. You can get it on itch or at uh, drive Through RPG. And it was by Emmanuel Milo. And it was lovely. Chris, have you played much Forge in the Dark? No, just very little. And I did find the cognitive load be a, a little bit of a barrier you know mm-hmm. i i like to have a game that's it's simple enough that i can hold all the rules in my head at one time and i, I never got there with blades or other force of the dark games i think if i played them more i would get into it position and effect these things uh i think start to come naturally to you once you're more familiar with it but this i'm loving the idea of this stripped down version yeah it just takes a few of the choices away mm-hmm. i think what's interesting is how modular forged is when you really dig into it and there are a lot of pieces you can tear out Mm. we're talking about this and i also was just reading vergence this week which is kind of a amber uh, sort of a multi-planar forge the dark hack and it takes out equipment completely and experience and some other things that i think of as like basic building blocks Mm -hmm. so it's really interesting to see how people are tearing out chunks and staying with sort of the core elements of it and that there's still a game there which is yeah. wild that's, that's and, and a very different game i'm trying to think is there another there must be another cyberpunk forge in the dark game oh but sure there is there must be it's a well, yeah it's a well i mean in some ways neo shinobi which we've been goofing around with is right but it's right. not like dystopian with the capital dys no but I know there has to be, but I don't know what it is. I'd like to see a shadow run. I'd like to see a shadow run for it to the dark. I'm yeah. sure somebody has done something like that. But here's that. the thing is, is, this is such a, like, it is cyberpunk, but it's a mission game. And it's mm-hmm. a it's a one shot. And it's just, like, really perfect. And it's a really introduction to that, those sets of ideas. And the thing about playing Forge in the Dark is accruing the different mechanics. And there's actually each portion of the game has a pretty small number of rules. It's just that there's like these phases you go through and each phase has different rules. Hmm. If you don't try to like think of it as just one big block of rules, but as we're in this phase, so now it's these rules, it's Hmm. easier, I think, to bring on. So this one is the scheme rules is mostly what it's looking at and working with. And it does a great job. I totally thumbs up it. I had a fun time playing it. And I think it is especially good if you are thinking of maybe moving on to other Forge in the Dark system, because it is a great intro. Awesome. Chris, how was your period over for September or August? It was really great. Off Gauntlet, I played, well, of course, Raccoon Sky Pirates, because I'm playing as much as I can. Knights Black Agents, Ooh. which has been really interesting. I'm actually in two different games of that now. Oh, wow. Yeah, which are very different. Zombie World, mm. I love that game. Little Dungeons and Dragons and Firebrands. Oh. Uh, yeah, which is uh, my first time playing it. I was really. Uh, it's really, I really striking. got it. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and then on Gauntlet, I played Agon. I played Voidheart Symphony, which I mean, we were talking about earlier uh, episode. Manish Tana, Why Is This Night Different, which is what game I want to talk more about. Fiasco, a science fiction fiasco, which is awesome. And Red Carnations on a Black Grave. Hmm. Which was super <laughs> bleak, but also moving. Oh, yeah. And really interesting because it's GMless, which is, of course, very suited to its uh, themes of socialist commune. And then Fiasco also is GMless. But Manish Tana, it's a deeply moving game and so wonderful. I just, <laughs> I'll get more specific. It has a rotating GM, but it's 
at base, it's about Passover Seder and the Exodus story. You are recreating, sometimes with a lot of new variations, the story of Moses and the Hebrew people trying to get out from slavery in Egypt and, and going out into the desert. It invites you to reimagine the story, reimagine who's involved in it. Like, if you don't have all the players, we didn't have a Moses. We said Moses died. Um, so it works really well with that because there's all these story prompts and playbook prompts that really bring you into it. So it also has a lot of rituals, like as if you were at a Passover Seder, with different things that you drink or different times when you drink or eat or things where you, you rip something in half or you wash something. So it was this interesting combination of being just suffused with meaning, but also holding that meaning and its interpretation lightly and inviting you in to explore alternatives. So what worked for me, the story and its characters really came alive. It had enough of the traditional relationship between characters that the fundamental story was still there. But it turns out there are themes in that story that are really robust. And so you can tweak them and all it ends up doing is having you explore them more deeply. The rituals are great, even online, or maybe especially because we were online, it really connected us all, I feel like. And it gives you a sense of, I am here now. And it sort of really gets your attention and your focus. Because you're doing the Passover story, it has these deep themes, community, family, oppression and power, death, miracles, memory, and like communal memory and communion with, it doesn't have to be God necessarily, but definitely transcendent forces. And so that was just, I knew it was going to be neat. I didn't know it was going to take me that deep, you know? Mm -hmm. It turns out that the actual act of being at a Passover Seder dinner and being in a storytelling RPG, there's a big overlap in that Venn diagram. Because you're telling a story together at a time when you've, you've come together. And there wasn't an actual meal, but it just really made me think about what a storytelling game even is, essentially. The two writers, Ben and Danielle, are cousins, and they were basically writing a rule book so that people could reenact what their own Passover Seders were actually like, which apparently involved a lot of discussion of alternate endings and, and sort of investigating the themes that way. So they're very charming, and a lot of the charm comes through in the writing. So all that was wonderful. I, if I had to say what I was less sure about, uh, well, this is a play test, so they're still clearly working things out. The guidebook, which is basically the rule book, uh, we call it a guidebook, it's cool. It's very long. It's easy to be intimidated by that. But it's long in part because it's got examples of play, discussions of the context for people who are not familiar with it. We skipped around a bunch. Ben was leading us through it. So I don't know what it would have been like to redo that independently. If we had played the full game, I think it would have been something like five hours. We were splitting across two sessions, just two and a half hours each. And they have in the guidebook rules about how to do a slimmed down version of it. Something else is just that I'm not Jewish. I'm coming from outside Judaism. I'm familiar with the Passover Seder. I've been in several. But if you're not familiar with it, I think it would be easy to be just not sure about what comes next or whether you really have a place in it. If Ben weren't there being so inviting, you have to rely on the text, which I think also does a good job of being inviting, but it also has a lot of things that are very much like a Haggadah, you know, the guidebook for the actual passive or Seder, Hebrew words and things like that. And if you're easily intimidated by stuff like that, you might be put off like, what are, what are these letters I don't even recognize? But it's a cross-cultural experience. And I think it's good to just go into it with that sense and be at home in it. You know, they did a great job in there making me feel welcome. So even the things I'm not sure about, I'm sort of putting a, a pinch of salt on that. My takeaway is that it's just a lovely storytelling game that relies on the bones and the spirit of one of the biggest epics, I think, has been community writing. And so it's just sweeping and intimate at the same time. Kind of wild. Mm -hmm. Sweeping and intimate is correct. Yeah. It is like absolutely that. That is the game I'm waiting for it to come out. So... When people are like, what is a story game? I'm going to just go, just play Mishnatana? 
find someone who feels like they can walk you through it. I've played it with a facilitator who wasn't Jewish, and then some of the players were, and it worked perfectly. I think the text is really strong. Mm -hmm. The themes are so strong. It's like an emotional experience. Yeah. It is kind of an exciting game to find. Yeah. I was overwhelmed by it. I think it's a brilliant game. They've done amazing work. Yes. There are two things that strike me. One is the ability to take a classic story and allow that remixing that maintains the core pieces of meaning. Unbelievable. Yeah. Like it's fascinating. Yes. And I would really love to see that with other kinds of stories. It reminds me a little bit of Aegon is reaching into some of that mm-hmm. same territory where we're getting stories that are being told very much in the form of of a particular mythic structure, but we're doing different things with it. Yeah. But the other thing it's doing that I think we started to see a lot more in recent years, and I'm thinking particularly of Yang Shi, Blood in the Banquet Hall, and this of collaborative games that are set in a very particular cultural context that invite you to come in, often with the aid and mediation of somebody from that cultural context to explore those stories, to enter into them, to play them out without taking them over, Mm -hmm. without a particular colonial vision. It's a way of carrying that across while keeping the core meaning intact. It's really interesting to see, and I hope with the RPG SEA meeting and new designers coming out of Middle East and Africa and that we're going to see more stories that can do these kinds of things. Yes. So let me talk about my September, August off gauntlet. The only things it did was a little hearts of balloon one shot. And then also songs for the dusk, which is a forge in the dark game that is very interesting. And I want to play more so I can figure out what's going on in it. And then on gauntlet, I did hearts of balloon. Uh, I also did some masks and Red Markets, which we talked about in a previous episode, the Change of the Lost PBTA, Godbound, which we talked about before, and then this Game of Fate, which I called Skyship Concerto. Again, I am one of the small portion of the gauntlet people who who likes Fate, who (laughs) who runs Fate. We've had a few other people do it, but it's a game that I like, but I also run very differently than other people. So what is this thing? Skyship Concerto is a fantasy steampunk game where we use fate and predominantly fate condensed. In it, you're playing the part of the crew for a flying opera house that is moving from city to city for performances. And so you have to put on concerts and plays. You have to recruit the audience. You have to deal with the hostile audience. You have to like wrangle your passengers. You fall in love. You fight bad things on the ship. You really want to be in center stage. They're all of the classic things. And this very much came to me. I backed Andrew Peregrine's Opera House RPG, which is a game literally about an opera house, a little more modern, but I adapted a bunch of the ideas from it. It's a great game and a great resource book for it. It creates a game that's very picaresque, that's wild characters doing goofy things in a strange environment. I wanted to have that feel of the skyship from Final Fantasy VI and then the opera house from Final Fantasy VI, all all of these kinds of things. And we did uh, four sessions and I made some mechanical changes to it uh, that eventually I'll put a a post up on the blog about what we did just for stunts and skills and things. So let me talk about what worked for me. Number one, I just said this a second ago, but I'll say it again. Opera house, if you're at all interested in any kind of theater stuff, for an RPG, the Opera House book is dynamite. Tons of great stuff. Talks about how shows are put on, who, what are the roles, what are the characters, what are kinds of stories that can be told in it. And while they're kind of been a little more, maybe a little more modern, a little less fantasy setting, it's easy to rework them in this. I built stunts and skills off of that to get the ideas across. Our players bought into the concept right away. They created characters that fit with the setting. So we had 
a musician composer wizard who had some substance abuse issues. We had a grand dame whose husband had been part of the sort of the management of the theater and and he had passed away. And so now she was kind of the, the mother hen in certain ways. We had a stylist who was a both a master of disguise, but also the center of attention. And we had a deadly dancer who was there seeking vengeance on the nobles that had killed her family. So it was great for that. I spent more time than I needed to coming up with a big map and building a background sketch. I used one of those random terrain generators, and then I spent four or five hours, like more than I did on any (laughs) other prep, doing this stupid map that we went to like two places, but I've got a great map now for a bunch of other areas. But that was fun. I love doing that kind of thing. And it's been a while since I've had a chance to do to a map. We also used a palette to focus things, which I haven't done for a while, but I've been doing it more and more recently. Basically, the idea that in session zero, we not only kind of set lines and veils and things, we go through and say, these are the kinds of things we want to see in the play. These are the kinds of things we don't want to see. And in particular, people tend to lean into, okay, these are the things we do want to see. Like, what are the themes? What are the kinds of stories? What are the elements? And that both gives me as a GM a lot of things to hang my hat on, but also it's a way of talking about tone without like saying, okay, what do we want for tone? Players will naturally kind of set the tone and if people wanted a story of vengeance and wanted to have a story we had to put a play on and there were complications with it. And that was really great. And I've been using the palette more and more. I make sure when we're using an online keeper, I don't put it on the same page as, say, the lines and veils or the safety stuff, because you want to keep that distinct. And it's a conversation I think you do after safety. That's been really good. It's also a thing players can go back and look at, or you as the GM can look at between sessions. So I was really happy I did that. The game itself, I ran it like I do Fate, which is a very loose, low detail Fate, flexibility, and wild stories. It, it, I'm very generous about what can be used for what. I'm very generous about the play there. I don't want to get bogged down with the economy. I kind of set the difficulties at a reasonable number so we don't have to create a thousand aspects on the table. Compels players got used to that by the last session. It was so much fun. One of the things I appreciate about Fate the most is it is very easy to hack. Like, I love PBTA. I really do. It's a game I will go back to again and again. But if I want to hack something for PBTA, that's a lot of work. I've got to sit down and really think about that and so on. And like I could hack 2D20. That's a fine system. But it doesn't have a certain amount of richness that the Fate hack, pretty easy, easy to allow people to have input. And it's a game that gives you a lot of resources. We had a, just the sheer fun atmosphere of like figuring out what the play was going to be about. They spent a session in town, like getting what the cultural themes were and who were the nobles and what the stories were. And then they talked about how, what the story they were going to do on stage were and how they were going to work the costuming and how they would work this and how they were going to send a subtle message to alienate certain of the nobles and things like that. All oh, this just wonderful wild things that that you can just do on the fly. I was at the same time listening to a history of opera to try and get terms and things like that. And and at least one of the players really knew their music terminology. And so they were riffing on that. So a lot of good things in it. Things I'm less sure about with this, I used the skill list that Opera House has, and they're very much roles like front of house or fly man or stylist. And those covered a lot of the bases, but I kind of split the difference in a couple of places where I had skills that did a couple of different things. And some of the skills were like a little more specific and some of them are more abstractions. If I were going to go back and do this again, I would redo that skill list to try and make all the skills kind of feel the same and maybe a little more obvious about what they did. I'm going to let Sherry comment on this in a second. Fate. I do love, but if I haven't run it for a while, it takes me a session or two to figure out what the right challenge level is. What's the right difficulty? What's the right number of challenges? All of those things to actually 
draw down player resources, to make them create aspects, to make them spend their fate points to do things. I tend to run fast and my pacing tends to be fast. Fate allows that. And it, in some ways, it allows me to go too fast at times. Uh, and so there's kind of a breakneck pace that sometimes I need to stop and catch my breath. And with fate, there's all kinds of things. We're moving from person to person. We've got different scenes. People are creating aspects that are playing off of each other. And, and it can get wild. The other thing that is I'm still less sure about, and this is a general thing for fate. Sometimes you can be doing something, doing an action, and you go, well, so I want to create an advantage. That'll create a thing that'll be on the table that somebody else can use. Create this advantage, and I get an invoke. Is that worth my time? Mechanically, I'm spending an action to get an invoke that somebody else can use. If I don't roll well enough, does it get one invoke or two invokes? The one thing about fate is sometimes I see under the skin, I see the mechanics, and my gamer brain goes, well, that's not efficient, <laughs> or something like that. Whereas PBTA kind of hides some of those choices, and they're kind of so abstracted, they go into the black box. In some ways, fate has a kind of a perfect information problem that you can kind of see that X will do Y if I do this, and that translates into this. And it, it makes it simple to hack. It makes it simple to teach. But... It's also easy for me to sometimes go, well, that's just X, Y. It's not really. And I sometimes forget that you need to stop as a GM and, and spend time talking about what those things are doing, why they're colorful, why they have flesh to them, and, and so on. So that's the thing I sometimes worry about. I think maybe I'm wrong about it, but I don't know. Sherry, you've played, so let me get your comments here. I think no matter what set of skills you pick, it will be a weird thing where people are arguing to be able to use other skills for a thing, because unless you have 15 players, you just don't have enough people who can do things well. A fake dice are cruel and unusual because <laughs> you are adding to them. You're often subtracting from your skill because you got these, these swiggy dice. So you're like going, I'm not competent unless I have at least a three in a skill. And even then, you're going to be disappointed with the outcome a lot of times. It's one of those things of, no, I don't think there's any set of skills. I thought yours were really good. And where we really struggled was no one wanted to be stage manager. That was the thing. We were all <laughs> wanted to be on the stage. so <laughs> But we were all wanted to be on stage or at least have a foot on the stage on occasion. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't go for crew. We didn't go for, you know, stage manager. We didn't go for, I don't know, whoever shovels the coal or whatever. <laughs> None of those things, which would have been handy. Instead, we were all face people. That was what you got was exactly what you would get from a, pe a bunch of people who were, you know, wanted to be glamorous while they kept the ship running. <laughs> so again, me running around below decks in, in fancy mules trying not to get them, you know, dirty. <laughs> that was a part of one of the games. I think that's just going to happen with fate inherently. I think that this was not a bad set of skills. I think that this was just inherently what's going to happen. I know exactly what you're talking about with the advantage thing. And I often think that too, after I make a create advantage, but I'm doing a create advantage because I'm playing a person who's smart enough to anticipate that someone that I want to succeed is going to need this opportunity. That is a certain kind of character and a certain kind of thing that you're doing. And I love fate for that built-in generosity that's there. It is really, you can go, I'm going to take this time to make sure that we succeed. Mm. And it's not as much as if I did a thing, but I'm not in every scene. I'm not making every role to do an action. The person who's going to be doing this action that's important is someone else. So I am prepping to make sure that they have more opportunities to exceed. I like that about Fate a lot. Chris, have you played Fate? I have, and I, I love Fate. I actually really like the probability curve of those four dice, but since negative four is an option, then yeah, you have to calibrate what success looks like accordingly. But I have not gotten it to work very well at the table. I don't think I was working with the right people. I think this was before I really understood that the composition of people at the table has at least as much of an effect on the success of a game as the design of the yeah. game itself. And you just need to be with people who are really comfortable storytellers. And this was a while ago now, a few years, so I think also the kinds of people I play with has changed maybe people's expectation about story games. But I love it. Like you say, I love how easily hacked it is, how it's almost more of a toolkit than a game. And I got this, mm -hmm. the, the, the toolkit book. I also love just how well it's explained and 
all, all that. Yeah. But but the game itself, if there are people comfortable adding to the scene, introducing things to the scene, coming up with creative ways to overcome obstacles, then it's great. If you're dumping some Pathfinder players right into fate, <laughs> it's not going to work as well. Um, and that's not their fault, you know. I love the attack ability. I agree mm-hmm. with you that, that sometimes it's better to be hiding some of those rules, like you say, so that it's less gamist. Right. But maybe I should run it on the gauntlet because I'm still looking for the right people to play it with. I'm doing Tachyon Squadron in November. We're going to see how that goes. Oh, great. I'm going to try. There's, there's so many good worlds of fate, so I'm going to get more of that out there. Listeners, we are going to move on to our second segment. The next Gauntlet Community Open Gaming will be happening the weekend of October 14th through the 17th of 2021. GCOG is the Gauntlet Gaming Community's free online tabletop RPG convention. Over the weekend, we'll be offering more than two dozen sessions with games like Brindlewood Bay, Monster of the Week, Hearts of Wulin, Star Wars Swoop Gangs, and more. All sessions are run with a set of safety tools and follow the Gauntlet Code of Conduct. Registration opens Monday, September 20th at 12 o'clock noon U.S. Eastern Time. We created the con to help new players get used to online play, showcase indie games, and introduce folks to our community. If you want to check out the event listings, go to bit.ly forward slash GCOG events all smushed together. For more detail on registration and procedures, go to bit.ly forward slash gauntlet dash community. We hope we'll see you there. This is in our second segment. We have our guest, Chris, is going to talk about a topic of their choice. So Chris, what do you want to talk about today? I would like to talk about GMS games. Okay. Or GM full games, however you call them. I am fascinated by this. I love the egalitarian quality to it, but I think they're a challenge to design so that they play smoothly. Just lately, I've been in or facilitated a lot of GMS games Fiasco, Red Carnations on a Black Grave, Firebrands, and, and of course, Reckoning Sky Pirates. And you need more structure, I think, in a GMS mm-hmm. game. There's these power dynamics in a game with a GM that can really sneak up on you if you're not going into it like, I am at the mercy of this of this game master. If you're not aware of the power dynamics, they will rear their ugly heads in, in sometimes uncomfortable ways. And especially when I was growing up, that was a thing we were constantly running into. Mm-hmm. But they also, games with a GM also have a better, more established dramatic rhythm to them. The players can entrust themselves to the GM to come up with a story. The GM can take cues from the players and give spotlight moments at different times and then can frame a new scene. And like I'm GMing an Icebox Agents game right now and I am taking care of the pacing. And that can be a very predictable pacing and nobody will mind Mm -hmm. because they're just experiencing it. So in a GMless game, getting that dramatic rhythm is harder. People aren't always sure when to end a scene or how to frame a new scene. In my experience, and maybe this isn't everybody's experience, but in my experience, people defer to each other and get very much like, well, okay, I, I could do this, maybe. And then, of course, sometimes it's just moments of silence. So the most successful GMS games have a lot of structure. You know, Firebrands has all these mini games and tells you very much how to set them up and how to resolve them. I think that there's a lot that we can take from board games in this. Obviously, a lot of, of GMS games already have board game elements to them, like rules about when a, a scene starts or what happens at a given mode of play, and cards. The cards in Red Carnations of Black Grave are very explicit prompts that take you to these ugly places of the of the uh, volatile communards' efforts, you know, war with France that you would never go on your own, or you would, or you would, but you would feel uncomfortable doing it. Like there was a card that somebody played that was the death of the priests where you have to make good on your threat to execute the prisoners who are priests that you have with you just to send a message to the Versailles government 
And I would not have gone there without that. That's like the darkest moments of Battlestar Galactica. Mm-hmm. Although I'm sure it's the other way around, right? Because of Conrad, something happened. Anyway, <laughs> having that structure tells you, okay, this is what the scene is going to be about. This is what's going to happen. This is how it's going to happen. And I, I think we can draw a lot more from board games. Obviously, board games don't have a, a game master. So like, like Reckless Five Pirates definitely uses cards and definitely has very strictly defined scenes. And for the Queen, Spindle Wheel, they use cards. Fiasco has that amazing mechanic with the dice Mm -hmm. and rolling them and subtracting them from each other and and is very conscious of the gamest elements that are funneling you towards certain decisions. I think that's fantastic. But we could have other uh, board game mechanics like work replacement where you put a worker on a certain station and that station isn't about the worker is not a character. It would be a, a vote for a certain story beat to happen. I have this great game that was kickstarted years and years ago called Alien Frontiers. And Mm -hmm. in it, you roll dice and the dice are your workers. You can only place them on certain stations when you have certain combinations of dice. But there are enough stations that you can always put it on something. And I think there's a lot to be explored there. If we think of it in terms of not structure for the characters or the monsters or, or bad guys, but structure for the story and what happens with the story next. There's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> One of my favorite GMless games, and again, this game has a, a lot of tight structure, and that is Before the Storm, oh. which is from the Pelgrane Seven Wonders collection. I think it's brilliant. It has a structure with, with the cards that helps you know where you are at any point in play. And what the next step is like. And I think that's really important. Like what you're saying. So people aren't going, okay, what's the next thing I'm supposed to do? Am I supposed to jump in? Do that? I think giving a structure that gives freedom, but also tells you where you are at any one point. But in terms of board gaminess, one of the things that it does is it actually has kind of a version of deck building oh. in that you're generating these cards. These cards are going into a deck and they don't do anything until you get to the very end. And then based on the cards that have gone into this deck, the choices that have been made and what cards are in there, you actually draw to see whether the ending is good or bad. You create and shape this deck that then limits the pool and everybody is going to get these cards and we'll see whether you get a bad ending or good ending on things. And so, yeah, there's a lot of board gaming stuff that I think definitely we can start to look at and adapt. Fascinating. Uh, Nemesis was also, I played from Seven Wonders, and that was also had the cards you draw with different problems, and I think helps mm-hmm. a lot. It's fascinating to me, actually, that there are genless games that don't have board game homeless to them that work very well, you know, like Belonging Outside Belonging. But it still has that token and economy, so there is this, yes. this weird... Board gaming is of, of resources that are getting passed around. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. GME's Refuge, which is written for Brinkwood, is a thing that's meant to be sort of an interlude, but like a long interlude, where instead you go back to the base of these people who are rebelling against the vampires. Mm-hmm. So this is a safe base that they have. And you have these scenes. And you're spending the tokens back and forth. And, of course, the tokens, you only get tokens if you do something uh, sort of underscores the weakness of your character and their problems and everything. So essentially there are these sad stories full of pathos of people trying to do a better thing. And then you turn around and we in that game, you spend those tokens to build something for the base. And it's crazy how much the oh. players will throw themselves <laughs> into, into the worst, saddest things and the most tragic things because, man, then you get a bathhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Or you get a lovely herb garden or, you know, these things. And it's just because you know the story, because essentially it's meant to be played within a Fortune in the Dark game where you're doing these schemes and stuff. And then the characters come back to the base. Mm. 
but when you play the bass, you're not playing your characters. You're playing the other people who are back there all the time being the support. Oh. But having those things, like the bathhouse, means you can recover more stress when you take a downtime interlude for it and those things. So that's the intent with it. But it was crazy to watch people go, oh, yeah. And, and then I just crawl into this painting. I don't know what's going to happen. because <laughs> <laughs> wow. yeah, It was awesome. Yeah, I do love the token economy in Blowing Outside Blowing. And that's really good for a, such a great, no randomness way of resolving your actions. But the times I've played it, there's still been this uncertainty of, is this scene over? What, yeah. what should we do next? Mm-hmm. And I think if there are some guardrails we could put on that to encourage people to take that agency of like, this time I'm setting the scene for everybody. Next time it'll be somebody else. I would love to see some Borkman stuff brought to that, too. There's an interesting clash that you get that, on the one hand, we know that having that structure makes it easier to play. People know where they are in the sequence. They they can step in. They know when it's their turn. They can move to do things and stuff. And that's one pressure. But on the other hand, you also got this pressure from people who are like, I really want my game to be free. Mm -hmm. I want it to be open to choices and things like that. And I understand that desire as well to not limit, to not curtail, to give people creative permissions. But I think that going too far one way or the other, like you have to find that fruitful middle between those. I think that's really difficult. And you can't write one game for everybody. Right. Some people need more structure and rely on it and would be stressed out with too much freedom. And other people... I think very much want to play the kind of game you're talking about, which sorts without masters a little bit like that, mm-hmm. where you have a lot of freedom to say what's happening and where and how. And I know a lot of people love sorts without master, but I will honestly say, and I played it with Epidia at Origins, mm. and it did not click with me. Like I was mm. felt lost the whole time. I do think that those games need modeling. Yeah. For instance, I'm so used to a certain kind of turn taking. So I get into them and I'm like, oh, how do I know what I'm doing? And then I feel like, oh, wait, I'm in charge of this aspect of the scene. Well, should I be doing bad things to people? Hmm. <laughs> I, like, what and am it, I supposed to be doing here? I could describe a lot of things, but am I supposed to be doing things? Yeah, absolutely. A con or a, a, a one shot is not always the best way to encounter these games. Because, sort of like you were saying, Lil, about fate, it takes you a session to the get into the rhythm of it. Mm-hmm. I think it probably takes reading the rules, having somebody who's familiar with them explain them, and then let you have a couple sessions before you hit your stride. Probably more important with these kind of games than with PBTA, which is in this great sweet spot of very simple rules, a lot of narrative freedom, but definite guide rules. Mm-hmm. That sounds good. We're going to move on to our third segment. Listeners, for our third segment, each of us is going to discuss something that is lately inspiring us or giving us joy. So, Sherry, what is giving you life? So, I know that this is kind of a cop-out for a podcast about playing games, but these last couple of months have really been full of amazing moments. I even mentioned that early on, but like, wow. So many different systems, PBTA, Force in the Dark, Fate, Lumen, and D20, among others. All of them, super different gameplay, different ways of getting to these amazing moments and just delivering. And I come out of all of these games singing and going, that's my favorite game ever. And it's like, why am I doing this? There's all these different systems. There is no best system. I just have to tell you that. They're, they all deliver really different gameplay, a satisfying gameplay, and moments that really were awesome and exciting and fun and I just, I'm so grateful. I'm so ready to play more more games of these systems, more systems, to keep on trying them. And I just want to say, keep designing, folks, because y'all are delivering. <laughs> There's just so much good stuff out there. Oh, Chris, what is giving you life? I just love shares all of that. It's so great. But what is giving <laughs> me life is a little restaurant here in Columbus called Hot Chicken Takeover. I don't know if it exists outside of Columbus. We've got a few locations here. I mean, it's a fried chicken restaurant. What can I tell you? It's very simple. Mac and cheese, slaw. But it's so good. Really? Like We can't have it all the time, you know, obviously. But we had it just recently. And 
<laughs> it's just lovely. And it's a great cause too. Like they employ people who have been incarcerated, and every time I go there, everybody is so lovely to me. So it's sort of a Columbus sensation, and I, the taste of that chicken stays with me for days afterward. <laughs> Not literally. Is, is it like the, the Nashville hot chicken? Like the spicy chicken? I, it is very spicy, yeah. I don't know if it's Nashville spice. They have a range of hotness. And in the Midwest, where we are, yes. people don't usually go for hot, right? <laughs> like just a little bit of paprika can be, woo, that's enough. It's too much. <laughs> but no, they go from cold to warm to hot to holy cluck. <laughs> and, and, and it's actually like holy with all these symbols after it. Um, we decided it's holy club. And I've never gotten holy club, but the hot is what we get. And it's it's good. Mm. Mm. That's awesome. Hot chicken is hotter than, oh, there's a place around here that does it. And I was not prepared for how hot it was going to be. And we eat spicy foods all the time, but apparently we eat Midwest spicy. So, mm. um, but it, <laughs> eye opening. <laughs> Is that, it, uh, is that Columbus, Ohio? <laughs> yeah, Columbus, Ohio. Okay, so you have to have the North Market and all the good stuff there. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come for the chicken, stay for the ice cream. Okay, <laughs> we'll have to, we'll, we'll, we'll go to Origins next time. We'll have to go and check it out. For me, I put a post up on the Gauntlet blog, and it started pretty much from Sherry describing a kind of character she wanted to run in this Hearts of Lillian one shot. She said she wanted her character to be a nemesis of someone else. And that got me thinking, and I think within two days, I had written up this playbook for the villain, not villain for Hearts of Lulin, with its own like role moves and all kinds of playbook moves and a version for Supernatural and stuff. And like, it's really cool. Like, I'm very happy because I wrote like all the playbooks in one big batch a couple of years ago for Hearts of Lulin. It never occurred to me to do another playbook. So doing another standalone has been just a delight. I'll put a link to it in the show notes, but I'm really happy with it. Lots of cool stuff. It opens up new play possibilities. I saw your announcement about that. I, I yeah. thought that was really great. I'm happy. I once heard someone say that a game is only done when you stop wanting to play it. So I don't think Heart to Lin is done yet, you know, in the, the end, because I'm still really, really enjoying it. Listeners, that's our show. The Gauntlet Podcast is a production of The Gauntlet. We have an online gaming calendar, The Gauntlet Gaming Calendar, where folks can sign up for our sessions. If you've enjoyed this show, consider supporting our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. That supports everything we do, including our network of podcasts and our magazine codex. You can find out more about all that at gauntlet-rpg.com. You can also reach us on Twitter at Gauntlet RPG or on Facebook at the Gauntlet.RPG group. Hey, you hear this a lot. I'm going to say it again. Please consider rating and reviewing our show. It helps us out. Even if it doesn't help us with the algorithm, it's really nice to see that people are actually listening. That makes it sort of worth it. Sherry, thank you very much for coming and hosting again. It was a joy and a pleasure. And Chris, thank you for coming on. We really, really appreciate it. Another plug. Raccoon Sky Pirates is out there. You've got the almost final version, right? The final version is on itch.io. I updated it just the other day. Hectic Electron by itch.io. Ah, okay. If you like Ash and Stars, I recommend checking out Rogue's Galaxy. Thanks so much. Listeners, that's it. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.